In this video, Dr. Jordan Peterson explains how to know who you are and how you achieve inner peace. And that's also why solving the problems in your local landscape is also the way of solving the big problems, you know. It's like, who does the dishes, when and why, and what are the rewards and punishments associated with that? Solve that, and you solve like 30% of the tension between men and women. So, and that means it's really hard to solve. It's not obvious how, how you do that, and how you do that over the long run, and what the reward should be, and how valuable it is. So, et cetera, et cetera. It takes an awful lot of negotiation. But if you don't get it right, then you have a continual war in your household. And you pay for that, because if you're having a war in your household, then you're going to be stressed to death, and that will kill you. So it's no joke to get these things right. And when you're doing it, it's applied philosophy. It's sophisticated and applied philosophy, because that's all you have if you don't have roles. Right? Roles, you don't negotiate. And that's good, because you don't know how to negotiate. No roles, it's negotiation, slavery, or tyranny. Those are your options. So, these are very complicated problems. That's also, though, why when you, when you work hard to solve them in the domain that you have in your hands, you're also doing the best you can possibly do to figure out how that might scale up on a broader, in a broader way. Right? I read a great book once called Systematics, written by a guy named John Galt. It's a really fast, fantastic book. Yeah, I know, John Galt, eh? Weird <laughs> enough, man. It was actually his name. John Galt is the name of a fictional character in an Ayn Rand book. And he's one person who stops the world because, for a variety of reasons. He stops the industrial world because he's thinking he's getting exploited. It's, it's had a huge effect on modern American monetary policy, by the way. So, anyways, this guy, John Galt, has written a whole bunch of axioms about organizational structure, which are quite brilliant. And there's a couple I really remembered, and one is, the organization does not do what its name says it does. I love that one. It's so smart. So, and the second one was, large functional organizations grow out of small functional organizations. So, if you want to build something big, you have to start it's small and local and then figure out how to make it scale and in some sense that's what you're doing that's what you're doing in your relationships with other people and that's what you're doing in your familial situation that's what you're doing in your intimate relationships you solve those problems you you develop a template like a skilled template of perception and action that you can then bring out into the broader world it's really important so so partly you know, you inherit a hierarchical structure, and you might think about that as whatever principles bind your culture together, and then some of that's rigid and pathological and half dead and needs to be destroyed and re updated, and some of it isn't, and you have to figure that out by negotiation, and that's hard. But you don't want to blow the whole damn thing down in one gust like the bad wolf and the straw house. It's like then you have nothing to live in. So it's, you, want to, you want to make modifications in a culturally determined structure with caution and care because that is all that stops you, that's all that protects you from chaos apart from your ability to update your models and you blow that over and you find out what's behind it and part of what's behind it is the dragon of chaos and the terrible mother it's not good you know, you saw what happened to Iraq when the Americans knocked over the hierarchy right? it wasn't good now, it wasn't good before because it was a tyranny, but it's clearly, it's not obvious that it's better now. You know, and it's, it's also possible that what's going to happen is it's going to be replaced by a way worse tyranny. So, knock over a structure, the water comes flooding in. It's just like a dike or a, or a dam. So, alright, so, that's your problem. Now, you know, I, I set that up as part of a moral hierarchy. So. At the bottom of any process, you say, well, maybe you're trying to be a good person. We might, we might as well assume that. You might say, why? But my answer to that would be, because it's better than not being a good person. You're going to run into a lot less pain and misery. And you're going to be a lot less destructive, and you're going to hurt a lot fewer people. And you might leave everything better than you found it. And that's not so bad. It's certainly better than doing the reverse of all of those things. So. Unless you think there's something particularly positively valuable about pain and misery. Because, and that seems to be, you could make that case, but if I put you in pain and misery, 
you'd do everything you could to get out. So even if you thought that that was a reasonable solution, if I imposed it on you, you'd do everything you possibly could to escape. So all that means is that you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Okay, so because what you act out is more representative of who you are than what you say. Because what the hell do you know about yourself? You have a vague model of who you are and a vague model of society. And so you can wrap off some articulated representations, but the probability that they're going to really map the underlying structure is low. So, okay, so we'll assume you're going to be a good person. That's what you're striving for. And then we can decompose that. And you can decompose it all the way down to micro behaviors. And so the issue is you try to build a hierarchy. At the bottom, it has all your micro behaviors, you know, the things you can do with your hands and your eyes and your mouth and your body. That's the highest resolution level. And then you're trying to organize those into higher and higher, into more and more abstract and powerful structures in some sense that are also homogenous inside. They're not full of internal contradictions. So, and that's how you establish peace. That's how you establish psychological stability. And that's how you establish peace. And there has to be negotiations at all of those levels. And roughly speaking, it's better to negotiate at the low levels, if you can do it. You know, so I, I use this example fairly frequently. It's like, so you've got a four-year-old kid, and their room is a mess because they've been playing. And you think, well, that room can't be a mess. So then you tell the four-year-old, clean up this room. And then you leave, and then you come back, and it's like nothing's happened. And the reason for that, in part, perhaps, is because... That's the wrong level of resolution to solve the problem at with regards to the four-year-old. You could only say clean up your room, which would be maybe at the same level as, say, family care there, to someone who has the underlying structures already in place. So, you might say to the child, see your shelf. And they can do that because they know how to follow pointing, and they know how to specify an absence, and they know how to link that to language. So they'll do that. See that hole? Yes. Okay, so you know the person has enough skill underneath that abstraction to implement it. Fine. Then you say, see that bear? And you know they can manage that. So they look at the bear. You say, well, pick up the bear. And you know they can do that. So you, they pick up the bear and you give them a pat. And then you say, put the bear in the space. And they do that and they look at you and you give them a pat. And it's like, and if you do that with a child for the whole room three or four times, then what you're doing is building the understructures, right, from the bottom up, and then you can say, clean up your room. So, but if the child, so exa for example, you come back and the room isn't clean, you might think, well, what do you do about a child who's being intransigent and won't clean up their room? And the answer is, well, the first thing you do is make sure that that's the right level of instruction. And that's the case also if you're negotiating with a partner or an intimate partner, the first thing you should assume if they do something stupid, which they certainly will, is that they're stupid. You know, and that you have to help them out building the microstructures of whatever it is that you're asking them to do. Because people aren't, people are full of gaping holes and they lack social skills of all sorts. It's like, and it's a huge part of the tension between friends and between couples. It's like it's absence of ability. 